The Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Welcome to Deep Dive with the Institute for Justice. I'm Melanie Hildreth, and I'm here today with a special guest, IJ President and General Counsel Scott Bullock. Before he became IJ's president, Scott spent 25 years as an IJ litigator. That means he has had his share of memorable moments with clients, judges, government opponents, and more. We're going to talk about some of those today, as well as how those early years in the trenches influenced where IJ is now. So Scott, 25 years as an attorney, IJ's first attorney, our first case, our first client. Can you talk about that experience? Yeah, it was uh, it was a great experience, both kickoff IJ, and it was also my first client as a lawyer, too. I was fresh out of law school, and we had the pleasure of representing two African hair braiders in the District of Columbia who were being told by the D.C. government that they had to get a cosmetology license to practice their profession, even though the cosmetology license had absolutely nothing to do with African hair braiding. So it was a classic IJ case on a signature IJ issue of challenging economic protectionism. And a case that may sound familiar to many of our listeners because we still litigate hair, braid case, hair braiding cases even today. Um, so in the, that early case, what, were there things that you learned or that you experienced that later influenced the way that IJ approaches hair braiding cases or, or other economic liberty cases? Well, it was, uh, it's said, a great case. The clients were phenomenal. The issue was presented uh, really well. We had a judge uh, in D.C. who was a district court judge who was a, kind of a unique character. He was the former general counsel of the CIA. Uh, when we appeared before him, he used to like to lean back in his chair and stare at the ceiling. So you didn't even really know if he was still on the bench when you were talking to him. He was hiding behind this uh, for him. At one point during one of the hearings uh, as D.C. was presenting its case, he barked to the D.C. council, this sounds like Soviet Russia. And so we thought this is going to be a pretty sympathetic forum and we were hopeful for it. But what we uh, encountered was this sort of unbroken line of cases from the New Deal on that said basically in this uh, realm of economic liberty, the government can do whatever it wants. Uh, and he saw that is a, a, that he had to essentially rubber stamp what the government was doing. And he ruled against uh, us. And even after being that skeptical. Even after being that skeptical, because he was faced with this kind of decades of case law. And so that is what we faced in the early days of IJ. And we knew that we had to change that. And that has been a part of our mission since those early days up until today. So you lost in court, but that's still something that looking back, we regard that case on behalf of those hair braiders in D.C. as a victory. How did that happen? Well, it, it imparted several uh, important lessons. Uh, one is the real need to have sympathetic clients, which Taladin Ukden, his wife, Pam Farrell, certainly embodied. But it also showed the power of uh, the court of public opinion. Because as public interest lawyers, we don't just argue in court. We use all the tools of public interest law at our disposal, including highlighting this to the broader public. And this got a lot of attention. John Stossel, when he was on 2020, did a great piece about the case called Rules, Rules, Stupid Rules. And it embarrassed the D.C. government. And it led to a legislative change that got Ukta and Pam in business. And they're still in business today. Well, that's and now fast forward twenty years. Uh, what is the landscape like for economic liberty in particular after all of that? Those years of of work in the trenches. Well, it's been really transformed because of the long term mission and vision that we had, where we took on these cases and slowly started building what's known in the law as a string site where we started winning these cases and saying that the rational basis test, even though it is broad and gives the government a lot of power, is not limitless. And so now, flashing forward 20 years or so, we have a great series of cases that have protected economic liberty rights, uh, said that economic protectionism is not a legitimate interest, and we've made really substantial progress. Still a lot more left to do, and we still have setbacks along the way at times, and courts refuse to recognize these rights at times, but the landscape is so much better than what it was when we started in 1991. And a great illustration of that might be another one of those classic IJ cases, 
the case on behalf of the monks of St. Joseph Abbey. Can you tell that story, uh, how you found the, the case, what the monks' experience was like, what they were facing? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is another classic IJ case with extremely sympathetic clients, a group of Doesn't Benedictine <laughs> monks. It, it's hard to find better clients than a group of Benedictine monks that were simply trying to sell homemade wooden caskets that they had made for their brethren for over 100 years. Uh, and being entrepreneurs, the way monks have always been, they saw an opportunity and started offering them uh, for sale to the public and were immediately issued a cease and desist letter by the state board of funeral directors that has nine members, eight of which happen to be licensed funeral directors. So it was a classic case of economic protectionism. And so we heard about this case. I reached out to the monks and said, you know, we'd like to represent you. We think this is outrageous. And they said, well, we're monks. We don't really like to sue people. And, First instinct, uh, maybe not to go to Maybe court. not to immediately uh, litigate a case. So they said, well, we have a, a state representative that's interested, and we think maybe we can get something done in Baton Rouge this term. And so they went to the legislature. They're pure uh, hearts. Oh. <laughs> exactly right. And no, going to the state capitol, thinking that they're going to be heard. And they had one hearing at a committee that Louisiana funeral directors organized, knew, of course, all the state legislature uh, legislature tours, uh, had that one hearing, and then it died in committee. And so I said, well, how about now? He said, well, we're going to give it one more go in the legislature. Went up this time, in legislation introduced. This time, they didn't even get a hearing. And so then they came back to us and said, now we're ready to sue. Perfect. And, and now in the meantime, um, they get that cease and desist order and you know, they're exercising a little bit of civil disobedience. Well, that's right. And so what was great about that uh, case, in, in addition to it uh, being a, a kind of a classic economic uh, liberty case for us, is that we litigated it um, and they were selling caskets and they asked us, so should we continue should to- Should we actually cease and desist? Yeah. Should we continue to do this? I said, well, there's certain risks that uh, that are inherent in this. If we would happen to lose, they might be able to go back and find you for every violation that you did this. And they said, well- we feel really strongly about this and the Institute for Justice. We're going to continue to to, to uh, sell them. And so it led to these kind of great exchanges during the deposition of the abbot, who was the head of the of the monastery. And my colleagues, Jeff Rose and Darpana and I were in the deposition. And uh, the attorney for the funeral board was asking these questions. They knew they were selling these caskets, which infuriated the board and the funeral directors, cartel in Louisiana. And he said, Abbot Justin... How many caskets have you sold during the course of this litigation? And as many uh, people might know, when you do a civil deposition, you basically have to answer every question that an attorney asks you. Uh, you can The attorney can object to it. Your attorney can object. But you essentially have to answer. There's no judge there to rule on the objection. Uh, but one of the few things that you can uh, not answer is on grounds of self-incrimination. So we're able to step in and say... Justice uh, or Abbot Justin, uh, you will not answer that question. I'm directing my client not to answer this question on the grounds of self-incrimination. He, he fifth pleaded Amendment, the fifth. right? He pleaded the fifth, which is usually reserved for mafia dons and other things. And the abbot was just sitting there, uh, not saying a word uh, for it. So we litigated that case from the trial court on up to the Fifth Circuit and got this great decision from the Fifth Circuit that struck down the licensing requirements uh, uh, and allowed the. Uh, the Abbey to continue to sell the caskets. The Fifth Circuit said that economic protectionism is not a legitimate government interest. And the great thing that happened from this case was not only a victory for uh, the monastery, uh, but it was a case that we could build upon and use uh, in our economic liberty uh, work. And it's also a case that others have used then too. And that's always what we try to do in our cases, uh, win so advances our mission, but to set a precedent that can be used by other small businesses and even um, people that are outside of the realm of who IJ might represent, but it can still benefit them in taking on economic protectionism. For, for instance, Tesla is challenging a lot of exclusive franchise uh, laws that still exist in states, uh, which, allow, which don't allow uh, companies like Tesla to sell directly to consumers. And they're able to use the St. Joseph Abbey case in advocating for open competition and free markets. Oh, that's a, kind of a surprise that monks, it turns into 
more more cars. That's right. Yeah. And, and that's what we always look to do is to set that precedent uh, that can benefit not only our clients, but as many Americans as possible. Definite ripple effect. Well, actually, that's a, a good transition to the other one of the other cases that I wanted to ask you about, which is one of your early First Amendment cases. I think people might not know that you actually that you litigated a First Amendment case it was cutting edge in a couple of ways, um, including the fact that it involved this newfangled thing. The internet, right? Yeah. So this is a case uh, in, uh, it, where we sued on behalf of a group of investment advisors and software producers against the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And uh, this was during the 90s when the internet was just taking off and email was really coming into uh, into uh, the popular kind of use. Uh, and before, when investment advisors would offer their advice about what they think is happening in the markets, they do it in the form of a printed newsletter that they would have to produce, drop in the mail, sent third class, and uh, you know, several weeks later, some of their subscribers would get the information, and maybe it would be useful, but in all, in many instances, probably not. But with the rise of technology, people were able to communicate instantaneously with folks who wanted to hear their opinion. So you didn't have to wait for a couple weeks. You could send an email or go to a website and have this sort of instant contact with people who were giving their advice about what direction they think the markets are going. So a lot of people think, that's great. Government agencies often think, this is terrible. My God, what are we going to do about this? People might have instant uh, communication, we've got to stop it. So the CFTC uh, did something that was contrary to about 400 uh, years of free speech jurisprudence is that they said that in order to offer this advice, you have to have a license. You have to be licensed by the CFTC as if you were trading commodities on behalf of individuals. And all these people were doing were just offering their opinions about what they think is going to happen. And then investors were free to accept it, reject it, follow it, or or not. So we were able to challenge this, uh, and it led to this landmark uh, decision, striking down what the CFTC was doing. And it was an early precedent protecting free speech and kind of software development in the internet age. Well, and it may sound a little bit familiar to listeners as well, because that, that idea of people offering advice, maybe making a living, living offering advice without being licensed, something that comes up in, in IJ cases even today. That's exactly right. You know, at IJ, we never just do these one-off cases where we kind of hear about an outrage and we feel like, oh, we're going to just go try to uh, do something about it. It's always part of uh, and tied to our larger mission and what we're trying to do to advance a particular rule of law. And so what we did in this case was really form the basis for our occupational speech work. Uh, and this is our first case in this area that we're still, as you mentioned, building upon today where we're representing tour guides and diet coaches because so much of, inf uh, of occupations today are information and giving advice. And so this allowed us to establish a basis for challenging these restrictions on occupational speech, which has become a major part of our uh, First Amendment work. Well, moving to, to even maybe well more well-known areas for IJ and certainly for you, eminent domain, the Kelo case is probably the most famous of IJ's cases. You, you found Suzette, you brought that case. What people and, and I suspect most of our listeners are, are probably pretty familiar with it. What they may not know is that that was, you know, as you said, we don't take these one off cases. That was not the only eminent domain case we had. We had many cases at the same time as Kilo prior to Kilo. And I wondered if you could talk about some of the most memorable or interesting eminent domain cases that were not the Kilo case. Yeah, uh, you know, and Kilo is another classic example of uh, what happens and how you can lose the battle but win the war. And and I, I mentioned the Ukta case, the hair braiding case was an early example of that. Kilo was kind of the, the, the really key example of that where we lost at the Supreme Court, but because we were using all these other tools of public interest law, we were able to transform uh, the world really in a very fundamental way that curtailed eminent domain abuse. Uh, but you're right, Kilo is the one that got a, a lot of the t attention because that's the one that rose up to the Supreme Court. But myself and several of my colleagues, in particular Dana Berliner and I, did a whole range of these eminent domain cases because we never quite knew which one was going to eventually get to the Supreme Court. So we tried to take on as many as we could. And some of them went uh, as far as state Supreme Court decisions, others um, set 
settled before they ever got that far uh, with it. But we took on uh, a number of them, including in my hometown of Pittsburgh, uh, where the mayor of Pittsburgh in the late uh, 1990s wanted to condemn a fifth of downtown Pittsburgh, uh, destroy uh, 60 buildings, uh, remove 120 businesses to put in an urban shopping mall. He thought that was going to be the key to Pittsburgh's revitalization. So you fast forward 20 years, looking back, that sounds so crazy. It's crazy. And and look at the state of retail today. Look at the state of shopping malls. Uh, And so we said we were going to represent the property owners. And they were classic Pittsburgh types, a lot of locally owned businesses that had been there for a number of years. It got a lot of attention. We put up billboards. uh, we, We threatened legal action. And the mayor eventually backed off. But you're right. Could you imagine? if he would have followed through with this. What a disaster this would have been in downtown Pittsburgh, which is now actually having a renaissance of its own, oftentimes by you know bringing in uh, other businesses and attracting them organically rather than this kind of top-down uh, approach. We did a case in Long Branch, New Jersey, where we represented a wonderful group of, of homeowners. Uh, and this was a case where the government was taking homes for homes. So they were condemning these small beachfront cottages where people would live for a number of years to put in high-end condominiums. And it just showed kind of the outrage of it, the reverse Robin Hood that exists in eminent domain cases, and we were determined to put a stop to it. And that exactly what we warned in the Kelo case and others would happen was happening, that you could take from one private property owner and give it to another one just because it was a fancier house. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, and so there was another case that we did that um, that you know I was really uh, near and dear to my heart that uh, in uh, Mississippi uh, too, and that was a case where uh, we took on the entire state establishment there that had promised land to the Nissan Corporation to build a new facility in the state, and this was wired from Trent Lott down to the governor to the local political players uh, for it. But it was going to impact uh, a family that had lived on this land since the 1940s, the Archie family, an African-American family uh, who this was their first land that they ever owned. Before that, uh, their family was sharecroppers. Before that, slaves. And so this land meant everything to them. And it wasn't even going to be used for the facility itself. They could build that further up the road. They just wanted to have this for storage and landscaping and that sort of thing. And they owned about 20 acres. It was classic family-owned land. The Archies lived on and cousins lived there. The the roads in the area were named after the Archies. And so uh, this was just a, 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 a group of family members that were so dedicated to this land and they wanted to stay. And we said, we are going to challenge this and put a stop to it. Sounds like it was an especially tight knit community. I mean, all uh, so many of these communities are quite close. That one sounds especially so. Were there things that you did to gather people together and and to kind of keep them inspired as as they're facing these incredible odds? You know, for if you're saying from the the top of the government all the way down. Oh, uh, you're right. I mean, this was ju- just family owned land, and then we worked with a number of people in the local community that wanted to support the property owners. We worked with a, uh, a civil rights activist uh, by the name of Stephanie Parker Weaver, who was known in Mississippi as Sister Hurricane, uh, <laughs> that uh, I would kind of come into communities and and really make sure people's rights were uh, protected. And we worked very closely uh, with her and uh, really highlighted uh, this. We got a great friend page story in the New York Times uh, about what was happening uh, here and really drew attention to this outrageous situation that had the the support of the public. uh, uh, And the Archie certainly had the support of the public. But as I said, the entire political establishment was wired against it. Uh, We actually brought in Martin Luther King uh, uh, III. Uh, Stephanie uh, knew him and uh, he came in for a a prayer vigil the night before we had our uh, hearing in the eminent domain case. Which brings us to one of my my personal favorite Scott stories, the the story of that that vigil and kind of the, the unlikely cast of characters, you know, from the IJ libertarians to the the civil rights leaders to 
a Swedish intern? Uh, well, but... this was just one of these kind of what we call kind of IJ moments. And so it was an incredibly touching evening uh, before we had the hearing. Uh, and uh, we uh, had this wonderful rally at the church. We joined hands at the end and sang, We Shall Overcome, the parishioners that were there to support the uh, Archie family. Uh, and we had uh, this fellow that was with us uh, named Gunnar Stromer, who was from Sweden and was studying kind of our approach to public interest law. And he was this very large Swedish guy, looked kind of like a Viking. Uh, and he said, could I come to this Vigil, I'd love to be there for it, and uh, and we said, okay, you know, come on down. And he wanted to help out, and um, and and he said to me, what can I do? And so we were at the church, and I realized nobody was handing the parishioners a, a, a program as they were coming in, and uh, and he said, oh, I'll, I'll do it. And and then it was one of those things where I saw from a distance kind of these people in kind of a rural part of Mississippi going into this AME church, and this very large. Swedish <laughs> man was saying, welcome, welcome to you. And it was- like, where are we? And they're looking up and like, what, 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 where am I? What's going on uh, with it? And so, um, and so we were able to do this uh, vigil. Uh, it was before an 18-hour hearing in court. This was something that um, the judge insisted on doing because- Contracts had to be uh, uh, had to be met, and that there was a huge pressure on the state for doing this. And so we started at eight thirty in the morning, and we ended at two thirty a.m. the following day. Oh Eighteen straight hours. One of the Archie uh, Andrew Archie, kind of the family patriarch, um, he was diabetic. He collapsed in the courtroom about eight thirty. Um, we said, Judge, we, he needs to testify. He said, Somebody else can testify on his behalf. Get going. Wow. And so we That's concluded brutal. at 2.30 in the morning. I said, this is not a very good sign that he was insisting on doing this all in one day. Uh, we lost at the, um, at the uh, trial court. The judge, uh, in his opinion, um, started his opinion with the, uh, the uh, Book of Common Prayer, a quote from it, which the, uh, essentially the message was, forgive me, God, for what I'm about to do. Wow. Uh, and ruled against the Archies uh, for it. So what we did was we got an emergency stay from the Mississippi Supreme Court uh, that was, uh, we did this in a huge uh, uh, hurry, but the Mississippi Supreme Court stayed the condemnation proceedings. And then all of a sudden, miraculously, the state said that they could build the plant without the Archies land, even though they had testified under oath in court during the 18 hour hearing that there was no possible way they could do that. And so Find we were, a way. <laughs> and they found a way because they had to move on and, the, and, 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 and you know, these decisions had to be made. And so the Archies were able to keep this land where they're still on it today. Oh, oh that, you know, the, 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 the incredible stories of the clients actually brings me to the, the last sort of thing that I wanted to talk about today, which is, um, you know, you worked with the monks, you worked with the Archies, you worked with Suzette. You also worked, you, you've just found some of our most like, really cool, incredible clients. Um, one of whom was the the client in our very first the first case as part of our forfeiture initiative, which you started in 2010, and um, really now is is still gathering steam, but has reached crescendo with a Supreme Court victory. Um, can you talk a little bit about Russ Caswell and his case, and and how you knew that was that was something that could be bigger than this one person? Yeah, I mean, the Caswell case uh, represented everything that's wrong with modern day uh, civil forfeiture uh, laws. Uh, this was a case where the Caswell family owned a small family owned motel in uh, Tewksbury, Massachusetts, and never had any problems with the law. And then shockingly, at a budget motel over the course of several years, some people engaged in drug activity uh, there. Surprise, Which surprise. Which never happens at the Ritz-Carlton. Oh, never sure. happens you know, never. Uh, at, at that or the Motel 6 right. down the road or the Fairfield Inn or all the other places that we documented had just as many problems, if not more, than the Motel Caswell. But what the Motel Caswell had was a, a property that was free and clear of any liens, mortgage interests, or anything like that. And, and no corporate lawyers. Probably. No corporate lawyers uh, for it. And if the uh, federal government and the uh, Tewksbury Police Department were successful in this forfeiture, they could have gained a nice commercial piece of property that was worth about $1.5 million 
free and clear because the Caswell has owned this property since the 1950s. And they were making the argument that it doesn't matter whether the Caswells are guilty or innocent. People had used the property to facilitate illegal activity. And so that was enough. And so we heard about this case. A family lawyer was helping uh, the Caswells in this situation. And uh, th- he didn't know much about forfeiture. So he contacted us and said, you know, could you give me some guidance and some information about this? I got the email and said, we've got to do something about this and flew up and met the Caswells. And it, it went on from there. At the trial, um, did you actually take the judge to their home to, as part of the the? How did how, well, how did that come to happen? Yeah, so this we did a site visit uh, to the home and uh, saw the the uh, the home was actually right next to the motel, and they were kind of making this argument that oh the Caswells were kind of negligent and letting this go on, and so we always tried to work with the police, as they always did. Uh, and they had a real interest in not having a lot of illegal activity sure. occurring because their entire family lived next door to the motel, including Russ's uh, granddaughter and, um, his, uh, the, and his uh, son and his family had lived with them uh, for it. So yeah, we did an on-site uh, visit uh, to them. And you know, it was one of these uh, cases where we knew we had to win. Mm-hmm. Uh, as the case went on, it was the U.S. Attorney's Office that litigated it. It was a case where if they would have won, 20 percent would have went to the federal government, 80 percent would have went back to the Tewksbury Police Department, giving them a vested interest, a huge stake in the outcome uh, of this. They knew they had a really tough case, but we said, drop the forfeiture action. Then the case is solved. They refused to do that. But they kept making more and more generous settlement offers to Ross to the point where they were basically saying, hey, if you just sell the motel and give us a couple hundred thousand dollars, we'll go away. And you think you face the loss of everything um, and then you could maybe get out of this with $1.3 million, something like that. And so the pressure was on him and Russ said, no, not going to settle. Uh, I, I couldn't live with myself if if I did that because I have done absolutely nothing wrong. And those are the type of people that we represent. And we knew, though, at that point, we had to win this case because Russ was risking everything. This was his retirement. This was his 401k, basically. So he's either the family his legacy keep, to his family, his he, own he was, children. Exactly. We we're going to keep running the motel or they were going – to sell it and then use those proceeds for their retirement. Russ was close to 70 years old at that time. So he really put his family's fortunes and and their and their future on the line to And in your hands. And in, in, in no IJ's pressure. hands. That's right. No <laughs> pressure at all with it. And so we knew we had to win. We did a four day trial in uh, uh, in US court in uh, in Boston. Uh, and thankfully, the judge saw through what the government uh, was doing, I think was frankly appalled by the behavior of the government and bringing this action. Uh, and she kept waiting. You could almost see her expression as she heard the testimony in this case, thinking, this is it? Mm-hmm. This is all you've got? You know, she was thinking, well, maybe Russ was in on it or somebody knew what was going on with it and some kind of bombshell testimony was going to happen. And it was just a parade of people acting behind closed doors that Russ had no idea what was what was happening uh, with it. And their argument was that this was enough. And the real problem with civil forfeiture, of course, is the law is written in a way that does give the government this power to do these types of forfeiture actions. And so we were very thankful that the judge ruled in our favor. We're now using that precedent in other cases. But it was an example of what happened when you, ha- when you have these open-ended laws. It lends itself to this type of abuse. So how did you know? Was there a point in that case or, or shortly thereafter where you realized that how widespread forfeiture is, that this is something that is going to be – I mean, it is now a major part of IJ's work – at what moment did you get to that tipping point where you're like, this, is, this isn't this is just a, a few cases dealing with an outrageous thing. This is an entire 
campaign. This is an initiative. Well, it was an issue that we've been following for a number of years and uh, and really investigating thoroughly. Uh, there was some outrage about civil forfeiture in the 1990s, and there was some pressure on Congress to change uh, the civil forfeiture statutes at the federal level. Uh, this led to the passage of what's called the Civil Asset Forfeiture Reform Act of 2000. Uh, and it did make some improvements to the law, but it's typical what happens in a lot of these situations is kind of attention's focused on it, and then people People say, well, problem solved, we'll move on to something else. But the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of the problems were not solved, in particular, the perverse financial incentives that exist in the law. And so forfeiture continued. It kept growing. More forfeiture powers were given to the federal government, a lot of state governments in the wake of, of 9-11 and kind of the upstart of the uh, – of the war on terror. And so this was just a growing problem, a multi-billion dollar a year industry for government. So we knew we had to do something about this. We put together a comprehensive program that was not just uh, uh, key litigation, which was, a, which was a major part of it, but it was also issuing a major strategic research uh, report that we did when we launched the forfeiture initiative called Policing for Profit uh, that we're now working on the third edition of uh, and used everything at our disposal to shine a spotlight on this, to take what was at once a relatively obscure issue that affected though thousands of property owners and shine a national spotlight on it. And that's where we are today. We've made a lot of progress on the issue, uh, but this remains a huge revenue generator for law enforcement agencies throughout the country. And so we are still working uh, throughout the country to try to further curtail civil forfeiture laws. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for taking the time to share the memories, the insights, uh, recollections of how IG became the force for freedom that we are today. With that, we're out of time. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the conversation, please be sure to let us know. Don't forget to follow and to subscribe. Mm-hmm.